Good evening and welcome to our four score speaker series. Tonight, we are excited to welcome Dr. Brian Matthew Jordan and Michelle Crowell to discuss their recently released book, Final Resting Places, Reflections on the Meanings of, Meaning of Civil War Graves. My name is Phyllis Evans and I'm the Senior Director of Development at the Lincoln Presidential Foundation. Our foundation is the only national foundation focused on increasing access to history, educational programs, exhibits, and sites highlighting the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln. We do our work in cooperation and partnership with others locally, nationally, and globally, and our vision is a world where freedom and democracy flourish, inspired by the life and work of Abraham Lincoln. For more information on how you can support this mission, please visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd just like to remind you that we will entertain questions from the audience, so please type them in the Q&A box below and we'll get to as many as possible. And now, please join me in welcoming our Foundation President and CEO, Aaron Carlson Next. Aaron? Thank you, Phyllis. Greetings, and thank you all for joining us for the Lincoln Presidential Foundation's Four Score Speaker Series program. We are delighted to be joined by two special guests for today's program, Dr. Brian Jordan and Dr. Michelle Crowell, to talk about final resting places, reflections on the meaning of Civil War graves. It's a diverse collection of essays reflecting on what death and memorialization meant to the Civil War generation and how subsequent generations to the present day have continued to memorialize and make meaning from the people and events that took place in that time. Dr. Brian Jordan is an Associate Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History at Sam Houston State University. He is the author of Marching Home, Union Veterans and Their Unending Civil War, published in 2015, which is one of the first times I had Brian speak at a program, actually, it was at that very book. And in 2020, he co-edited The War Went On, Reconsidering the Lives of Civil War Veterans. A Thousand May Fall, an Immigrant Regiment's Civil War, followed in 2021. And his most recent book is the subject of our talk today, Final Resting Places, which he co-edited with Dr. Jonathan White. A native of Akron, Ohio, Dr. Jordan serves as the book review editor for the Civil War Monitor and is a member of the Society of Civil War Historians. He is the founding co-editor of the Veterans Book Series from the University of Massachusetts Press. His more than 100 articles, reviews, and essays have appeared in the Journal of the Civil War Era, Civil War History, and the New York Times. Dr. Michelle Krell is the Civil War and Reconstruction Specialist in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress, where she also oversees presidential papers from James K. Polk through Theodore Roosevelt. She co-curated the 2012-2014 exhibit, exhibition, The Civil War in America. She received a BA in History from the University of California, Riverside, and an MA and PhD in History from the University of California, Berkeley. She has worked as a library assistant at the Historical Society of Washington, DC, an assistant professor at Northern Virginia Community College, and as a research assistant for historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. She's the author of several articles and books on topics relating to the Civil War, as well as Quantico, Virginia, and the World War II Memorial in Washington, DC. And she's with us today because she wrote one of the featured essays in Final Resting Places. Brian and Michelle, it's wonderful to have the two of you with us today. Thanks so much for having us, Erin, and um, it's great to see uh, both of you. Yeah, it's delightful to be here. Thanks. So to get things started, our viewers often really appreciate knowing about your professional journeys, what got you here. So Brian, starting with you, could you tell us what led you to your career as a historian and to the subject matter you've so, you're so clearly drawn to in particular? Mm -hmm. Well, I have always been interested in history. I had the good fortune to grow up in Northeastern Ohio, uh, which teams with US presidential and Civil War history. So I spent my youth visiting presidential homes and grave sites and uh, became absolutely captured by uh, the mid 19th century past. Uh, went off to Gettysburg College, where I worked with the Lincoln scholar Alan Gelzo, um, and then off to Yale um, to work with David Blight on a dissertation about uh, Civil War veterans. And um, I have the best job in the world. I get to pay to, to teach and think about uh, our nation's most pivotal moment uh, every day. Wonderful. Michelle, what led you down your career path and what drew you to presidential history in particular? Well, um, I have to say it was actually a children's book. 
that I had a meet, meet Abraham Lincoln book that I think my parents had given me when I was a child and, and just became absolutely enthralled with Abraham Lincoln. And that developed into books about the Civil War. So I was always a Civil War person, always a history person. Um, that's what I did throughout throughout my college years. Took a few twists and turns along the way in the career path before I got to the Library of Congress. But um, kind of like like Brian, it was just always a, a topic of fascination for me. And and I and even though I do other things other than presidential history, uh, you know, I think with the presidents, that's one good way of getting into the, the broader time periods that they lived in and get into some of the issues. And and with the collections that I have at the Library of Congress, it's their personal papers. Mm -hmm. So you also get to know them as individuals and see what people wrote to them and what they wrote. So it, it really is a, kind of a, a nice uh, social, personal kind of history as well. That's wonderful. Brian, your work, um... Is, is often focused on stories that have been buried, I would say, literally and metaphorically, um, for example, in veteran pension records. So this book feels like a natural continuation of, of that work that you've done. Could you tell us, though, why this particular book at this time? So I think uh, this particular book at this particular time, what John White and all of our contributors uh, really wanted to excavate here um, our Civil War grave sites as, as particular sites of memory, as particular sites where Americans, during the war itself and in the generations that followed, uh, Americans have, have turned to grave sites and to cemeteries as places to find and make meaning of, of the war. And we've had sprawling literatures about Civil War memory, um, about common soldier monuments, uh, about filmic representations of the war, museums, archives, uh, but no collection um, until this one that had really focused in and honed in on the grave site, on individual tombstones, cemeteries as sites of memory. So as a nation, obviously in the last few years, we have thought quite a lot about how it is that we tell stories as a nation about war, um, places that we turn to, to to find meaning about the war. And John and I just thought that this was a really interesting time to pull together some of the leading writers and thinkers about this conflict, uh, ask them to reflect on, on graves as sites of meaning, and uh, really to think about how those meanings have, have changed pretty dramatically uh, over time. Yeah, well said. And Michelle, you were one of the authors and scholars that they asked to participate in this project. And, and knowing you as long as I have, I know that you've unearthed some really incredible stories related to inscriptions on tombstones and memorial markers. When John and Brian approached you about contributing an essay to this book, did you know you wanted to focus on Elizabeth Keckley's gravesite right away? Or, or was this a really difficult choice that you had maybe five essays you wanted to write and you had to narrow it down to this one? No, actually, it was pretty immediate, and and I had the conversation in, in person with John one one evening at another event, and I said Elizabeth Keckley, because she's just got such an interesting trajectory, and also it, as it turned out, particularly as I started doing more research and and getting into it, that her tombstone and its status was reflecting her historical status as well. So it was always something that I was interested in, but it it ended up having even more meaning than I was anticipating when I started it. Yeah, that's wonderful. And let's dig into that a little more. So Elizabeth Keckley, I'm I'm guessing a lot of our audience members know this, but in case there's someone out there who doesn't, formerly enslaved, um, becomes an independent businesswoman, highly successful modiste, ultimately creating dresses and becoming a confidant to the First Lady Mary Lincoln. You open your essay with this incredible quote um, from Keckley herself that would have been, it, it felt to me like it would have been appropriate at the start of several of the essays in this book. Actually, it was so evocative. And it begins, quote, to look upon a grave and not feel certain whose ashes repose beneath the sod is painful. And the doubt which mystifies you weakens the force, if not the purity of the love lover offering from the heart, end quote. Michelle, what, this is, first of all, that's a stunning quote, but what prompted Keckley to say that? What was she talking about? Well, she was actually talking about her own mother's grave 
that after after she purchased her her own freedom and the and the family that maintained her her mother in slavery she she left st louis the the enslaver family went down to vicksburg mississippi and her mother ended up being being um, buried in an unmarked grave. So essentially, Keckley made a decision not to try to find her mother or not to go to her mother's grave because she wouldn't be able to find it. And that would be, you know, painful as she described in, in her own book. And, you know, I hope, you know, spoiler alert, I'm not, hopefully I'm not getting anything away, but Keckley ultimately ended up in an unmarked grave herself. So yeah. Let's well let's talk about that because your essay shares the story of your efforts to find and pay respects at Keckley's grave. And that wasn't a straightforward journey. Can you describe what you thought you were looking for um, and what you found? Right. The 1942 book They Knew Washington or They Knew Lincoln by Johnny Washington, who was an African American historian in, in Washington, DC, he had Keckley is a huge figure in that in that book, obviously because of her connection with the Lincolns. And he had taken photos and of both the grave and the tombstone. He had described where where her grave was and what it looked like in what was then the Columbian Harmony Cemetery in Northwest Washington or Northeast Washington D.C. So when when I first started, you know, sort of this intellectual relationship with with Elizabeth Keckley when I was an undergrad. I thought, okay, well, I will go visit her grave when when I'm in Washington D.C. at some point. And I knew what it, I knew what the tombstone was supposed to look like. I knew it was supposed to be in this cemetery. And when I first kind of had the opportunity to do that in 1995, the the city had changed, and I wasn't entirely sure where the disconnect was. And then, as it turned out, the original cemetery that Keckley had been buried in in 1907 had been sold to a developer, and the body, the remains, had been moved to this new Harmony, you know, this Harmony Memorial Park out in Landover, Maryland. And I went out to Harmony to try to, you know, lay flowers on her grave, as I kind of told myself I would do. And at that point, the people in that section who had been moved were all in unmarked graves. So the cemetery staff were able to tell me, well, when you find the little marker for that section, she's kind of, you know, three graves in. And I went out there and I could figure out approximately where she was, but there, there was no place that identified her or where her resting place was. So I sort of, you know, left the flowers that I brought with me as, as best I could, but it felt very incomplete and that I hadn't done what I said I was going to do. And even though I had read Keckley's book several times before, I hadn't paid attention to what she had said about her mother's grave. It was just another mm. thing that, that had been in there. And I reread her book after I had been to the cemetery and I thought, oh, this is even worse that, you know, she had these own, she, she understood what it meant to be in an unmarked grave and, and how incomplete all of that felt. And then she was, she turned out to be in an unmarked grave herself. Yeah. Brian, several of the essays in this book, including Michelle's grapple with this idea of erasure, um, intentional, unintentional, the pursuit of erasure, the fear of it, the resistance against it. Were you expecting that theme to come up as often as it did in, in the essays throughout this book? We, it was really quite a surprise. I mean, I think one of the most poignant examples beyond Michelle's piece is is actually Michael Vornberg's essay uh, on uh, 20 soldiers from uh, the 21st United States Colored Infantry uh, who were drowned in the Stono River um, in an assault on Charleston in 1864. And I won't spoil the, the essay for our listeners, but it's just a really evocative piece that that asks uh, who and what do we remember? Um, and what is it that we do when we memorialize, when we erect a marker or a monument? And is that always the most appropriate thing? And it's it's just a stunning piece here, but we were certainly unprepared um, for that piece. Of course, the Civil War did nothing better or more efficiently than make final resting places and make diverse types of, of graves. Uh, but certainly that theme of erasure kind of developed organically through through so many of these pieces. Mm -hmm. And in in calling out that essay in particular, it it reminds me of the fact that this idea of of that as a justice or an injustice is also something that comes up. Um, some of the essays deal with someone who was, uh, you know, the victim of a crime, for example. Um, and was there an injustice uh, that took place that is, somehow being, you know, erased itself in, in erasing the, the final resting place. Michelle, um, 
So we are going to spoil a lot of your essay for our listeners, but hopefully that's that okay to read the rest of them. Because uh, I don't want to leave her in an unmarked grave. She's that's not right. Anymore. We can't. We can't <laughs> leave it there. So Michelle, you were able to track down uh, the new Harmony Cemetery, as you mentioned, where you, as you note, thirty-seven hundred, I think, people's remains were moved, um, but the tombstones themselves weren't um, all relocated. Um, so, and you also referenced John uh, E. Washington's indispensable book, They Knew Lincoln. And and you, you point this out in your essay, and this is also something that some of our listeners might know, which is that he was motivated to, speaking of erasure, he was motivated to write that book in part because a journalist had come out, this is in the 1930s, and was claiming that not only was Keckley not the author of her memoir, but that she had never even existed in the first place. And right. so part of the reason I, I it seems that he even took the photo of her tombstone was to provide the tangible and the positive proof that she had in fact existed. Um, but there is a happy ending to this story, isn't there? So can you tell us how communities came together to right this wrong and mark Keckley's grave? Exactly. So she remained in an unmarked grave from approximately 1960 until um, into into about 2010. And as I say in my essay, it the her unmarked status sort of reflects how she was interpreted historically as well, because um, you know she had this book that she had published in in 1868 that you know was republished periodically in in the in the 20th century, but she was always really only spoken of in terms of her observations of the Lincolns. Mm -hmm. And so she's sort of in an unmarked grave and her own status is sort of on the periphery. But about in the early 2000s, uh, it was brought to uh, you know the historical community's attention that she was in this unmarked grave and some organizations banded together and, and put Put funds together to pay for a tombstone for her at Harmony at the new Harm at the Harmony Memorial Park in, in Landover. And the tombstone or the grave marker that was ultimately erected in, in 2010, it wasn't a replica of her first tombstone, which for one thing spelled her name incorrectly, and that's a whole nother, a whole nother subject, but it also then referenced her as a full individual on her own that it had her photo it told about her her dates that she was enslaved she was a modiste other things ab about her and and so now she has a tombstone or kind of a flat grave marker that really is about her and her life and her contributions and it's all about elizabeth keckley and, and it includes her signature that actually has her her name spelled correctly and and so it, it feels like she's been you know given back her own identity both in terms of how her name is spelled and that she is she's worthy of 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 marking essentially and so for me it was a happy ending partially because when when I started working on this on this essay for the book that gave me the perfect excuse to finally get back out to Harmony Cemetery and take flowers and you know feel like what I had tried to do 24 years earlier was coming full full circle but in an even more satisfying way because she's been you know, she's finally gotten a New York Times obituary and there's just been so much more attention on her, not just as an observer of the Lincolns, but as her of as, as, a, as, a, as a person who is fully worthy of study and, and remembrance in her own right. Mm, absolutely. Um, Brian, there is another theme uh, that runs through this book that's sort of the opposite of erasure, which is this the larger than life or performative aspects of memorialization. And some cases quite literally monuments are designed as a place of performance demonstration parades and ceremonies and sometimes it isn't by design but it happens anyway is there a particular example in this book that stands out to you um, as an essay that's about a, a memorial that was designed from the very beginning as an attraction if you will um, as a, a place of pilgrimage mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, we have an entire section on generals and their steeds, and I would say certainly the graves of Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, uh, both of our contributors uh, in those essays detail uh, kind of the jockeying that went back and forth between various cities uh, to try to claim the bodies of 
these leading figures. Um, obviously, of course, New York City won out in the case of U.S. Grant, and Robert E. Lee would be buried um, at Washington and Lee, where he had been uh, president uh, after the war. Uh, but both of those sites kind of became um, real sites of, of pilgrimage. Um, the Lee Chapel, uh, a real um, site of veneration for the lost cause, and uh, Grant's tomb, uh, right? Um, um, Who is buried there? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's... I feel that's, like if I didn't say it, that was going to be one of our first questions. So right. That's right. Um, but I would say both of those stand out to me as 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 great examples of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michelle, is there an example you've seen in your research or travels that maybe isn't used by the public the way perhaps the designers intended? Um, and that question is open to you too, Brian. Gosh, I might have to think about that one a little bit more. Um, well, maybe not so much how they're they're not intended, but partially because I was rereading the book over again and, and also that we've got the Montgomery Meg's papers at the Library of Congress, mm -hmm. you know, the the John Rogers Meg's monument in Arlington Cemetery that Barton Myers wrote about is, you know, it's it's something that is there to be seen and and it has a, a very distinct message to it because as many people will know, Montgomery Meg, Quartermaster General Montgomery Meg's son, John Rogers Meg's was killed by Confederates in the Shenandoah Valley. And Meg's took this as cold-blooded murder instead of an act of war. And to monumentalize his son, it is, I guess it's what about a two third size mm -hmm. um, depiction of John Rogers Meggs, a kind of a flat bar relief of him at the moment of his death. And, and, and that's not just about the son, but it's about how the, how Meggs felt about the death of his son and the Confederates and that it started at Oak Hill Cemetery, but when the, the remains were moved to Arlington, it is now in Robert E. Lee's family's backyard. And so it's something that that shows it's it maybe not performative or not how somebody would expect, but how evocative of a message that that tombstones and final resting places can be as well. I appreciate that example, Michelle, especially because it's it's something that is obviously so intensely personal and intentional for Quartermaster Megs. And he is, to your point, putting it right in um, Robert E. Lee's yard. Um, and and the entire Arlington National Cemetery is an example of that, but that is by far the most personal um, example of that from the quartermaster himself. Um, all right, great. Thank you so much. So, um, and while I think the story of Arlington National Cemetery is well known, the one that you just pointed out about his son, I, I think that that is actually still lesser known, that Meg's son is buried there. Um, and Michelle, you know in your essay that Keckley, and we talked about this just a bit ago, has been resurrected more recently in the broader American consciousness by this resurgence of scholarly and popular depictions, including in Spielberg's movie, Lincoln, where she's depicted in that. So my guess is that most people who pick up this book will know who Elizabeth Keckley is, for example. Yet, as many of these essays do, it still plums lesser known history, which is one of the things I really appreciated the most about this book, one of the things I appreciate the most. So for example, in yours, I would wager not many people outside of the DC area know about Harmony Cemetery, but they might have encountered very similar situations elsewhere, for example, in their own communities. Have, have either of you had that reaction to this book um, where people are either asking you, um, questions about it or something about it is resonating with them in an unexpected way. Brian, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> so I, I think there's a universality uh, to graves and to final resting places. And certainly John and I have, have heard quite a lot from folks who have picked up the book um, that have made connections to um, cemeteries in their hometown or to ancestors, to family graves, to that search for a final resting place. So I think uh, that's something that we wanted to, to bring home, right, is that this massive event uh, of, of the Civil War, um, right, reached into individual towns and communities and its effects were felt uh, across space and time in all of these different faraway places, right, the, the war annexed 
ordinary lives and communities, uh, large and small. And I think, um, you know, we've got the kind of the tapestry of that here represented in this book with graves as far away as Sao Paulo, Brazil to Brunswick, Maine, right, uh, to ordinary uh, grave sites in, in Elgin, Illinois, to, uh, you know, the national cemeteries that we all know. So I think just thinking about the human texture and the dimensions of, of the loss is something that this, uh, the essays taken together collectively help us to, to do. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I'll just say, I mean, I was just part of a of a panel discussion uh, from some of the contributors and and John White at the Lincoln Forum last month, and we all we we spoke about our respective essays or with Melissa Wynn about the photos that she took, and when we got to the Q and A section. Somebody, one person had a question Im embedded in there, but everybody just wanted to tell us their stories about you know my father's grave or this this cemetery that I'm aware of or uh, because you know essentially we we all lose people or we all have you know death is something that we all we all confront regardless of when and so many people had these connections with what it meant to them to go to a military cemetery where their parents were or a, a cemetery or you know a, something where it hadn't been maintained and you know that's an, that's another thing we can get into is you know the difference between confederate burials and union burials and and the messages that came out of that but that was something i was very struck by is when you have something that's universal like this, even if you're just talking about civil war graves, it touches people in terms of their own lives and their own experiences as well. Yeah, that's so true. And let's go ahead and get into that because that is something that runs throughout the book. And Brian, as, as you and John point out, that how the federal government deals with burials in cemeteries is fundamentally changed um, during this period in time. Um, but you have the immediate need to bury the war dead uh, whether on the battlefield or in the hospitals or what have you. Um, and then on the on the flip side, you have this great movement. We talk about it, you know, it's about final resting places, but the the sheer volume of movement is something that really comes through throughout this book. Um, you know, families bringing loved ones home if they can, families traversing, you know, states away trying to find their loved ones that have been buried. What what are the differences between how the Union war dead were buried and the Confederate war dead, both in the North and in the South? And then how does that affect the system that we have today of, of cemeteries, federal cemeteries? Mm -hmm. Brian, do you want to start us out? Sure. One of the things that struck us right away when we were working on, on this project and going through the records of the Quartermaster General's office at the, the National Archives is that really we owe the origins of our federal national cemetery system to this raw, immediate period right after the Civil War, when, uh, of course, the South is really a one vast boneyard, right? Um, soldiers are buried hastily um, at hospital sites, at battle sites, and ordinary farmers' plots are, are littered with grave sites. And there are lots of stories in the immediate post-war years of farmers um, kind of turning up bones or defiling graves, sometimes deliberately, other times accidentally. And it just drives home to um, the Quartermaster General's office uh, the need to collect these graves into national cemeteries. And so that national cemetery movement, rebels defiling graves, um, leads to this effort to to kind of collect and to memorialize and to make a statement about um, Union war dead. Of course, Confederates are excluded um, and initially, uh, and um, it's only Union soldiers who have grave markers. And then eventually over time, kind of following in sync with the trend toward national reconciliation, towards sectional reconciliation, you get concessions right, that are made. Eventually, uh, Barbara Gannon's essay in the book, I think, does a beautiful job of kind of, kind of laying out the history of uh, headstones themselves in the national cemetery system. But uh, as you progress closer to the 20th century, you do get uh, federal um, uh, money appropriated to mark Confederate graves um, and um, kind of more of a, a liberal policy there. 
uh, but it's it's a fascinating history and it is in flux, right? Ladies Memorial Associations going to um, retrieve bodies um, and and repatriate them in southern graves and and both sides kind of understanding immediately the way that the emotive power of graves to drive home a message about um, what they felt the war was about and what their sacrifice, what they wanted their sacrifice to mean moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes the very same memorial can offer healing for some and and pain for others at the same time or at different times. How um, how did that concept come up throughout this book and how important do you think it is for public monuments to um, to to have the space for those different points of view, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, the essay that comes immediately to mind there and with that question is the the essay on the U.S. Dakota War of mm -hmm. 22. Um, uh, Melody Andrews uh, wrote a just a beautiful piece on um, the um, 38 um, uh, Native Americans who were executed um, in December of 1862. And there was a mass grave there in Mankato, uh, Minnesota, that was very quickly emptied by doctors who wanted to use those bodies for uh, anatomical uh, experiments. But Mankato has been wrestling all the way up into the 21st century with the legacy of that event and what it means and giving space for indigenous peoples to um, you know, really define that event um, and to, to be able to tell their own story. So. Um, and that, that's what I think comes through you know, throughout the book is that these grave sites, um, you know, can help amplify um, lesser known uh, people. It can help to recover uh, stories that have been buried or lost mm -hmm. and people to find um, meaning and um and, and certainly, you know, ordinary civilian victims of, of the war who we don't consider kind of heroic war casualties, right? Their stories matter. Um, um, Non-combatant deaths that we often gloss over in, in accounts of, of battles, we have those stories here as well. So grave sites can be a place where um, people can find that healing, but also um, continue to, you um, you know, make claims about the war and prosecute, um, uh, prosecute the war, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up that example because that's that's one I was thinking of of earlier too when I was talking about how how people mark these and then it is a place where there have been demonstrations and performances by you know theater groups and they're finding different ways to interpret it. Whether the memorial, like even where the marker when after it had been removed. You know, the the idea that removing that wasn't really resolving the conflict in any way that um, the community needed to find other ways to process it in a way. So, um, well, and, if, and if I can, I just to kind of piggyback on that. One thing that I was so struck by in, in the book is when you pair Carrie Janey's article about the cemetery at at um, University of Virginia and Hillary Green's, which I think was at Alabama, yep. and and how those cemeteries were so in, in engaging the the campus community that both both Hill, both Professor Green and, and Janey use them as teaching tools. And, and have discussions about what does it mean, for example, for enslaved persons who are buried there that aren't, that aren't recognized. And how, how do you go about, you know, sort of rectifying oversights in the past? So I, th I thought that the two of them were, were very nice in terms of using them in, as educational and a, as a way to have discussions about the evolution of how you, how you, how you deal with, with people who are not recognized or who were not treated uh, fairly and being able to use those as discussions that then may lead to something positive and and um, more restorative. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Michelle, and that that also makes me think of an earlier point you made, Brian, about you know who do we choose to memorialize and where and when. Um, and I'm glad you brought up those examples too, because it, it reminds me of some of my earliest experiences on school field trips, having to learn about and you know find a find a grave and then try to understand who the person was and who the individual was, and learning to do research in that way. Um, and when I was at President Lincoln's Cottage prior to our opening, we worked with an Ohio history teacher who had his one of his senior history classes 
do a research project on the Soldiers Home National Cemetery, which is the predecessor and contemporary of Arlington, which is right there next to the cottage. But we had no idea if there were any U.S. color troops or um, or otherwise Black Americans who were buried in that cemetery. It was uh, from the Civil War period, that is. It's still in use. Um, and so they were able to take a lot of the primary sources and do that research. So um, it's just even the opportunity to do research and learn more about these people is, is a really powerful thing about these cemeteries. Um, so, and not surprisingly, a lot of these essays deal with lesser known soldiers, sailors, and civilians. Um, they provide a lot of information that I think that will be new to a lot of our audience members. Some information that I had never read before, Ed Ayer's uh, essay comes to mind, the way he was able to dig into a very personal family history, tie it into this larger conflict was just very well done. There is one essay though, um, that I had to reread the start of twice because it felt a little bit like a fever dream. And, and Brian, you alluded to this one, but it's the essay Confederate Tombs on Brazilian Soil by Victor uh -huh. Isaacson. Uh -huh. And so I knew that Confederates had fled South, including some resettling in Brazil. But the way this essay starts, it's with then Governor Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter on a tour of nations that includes Brazil. And during this visit, and he visited more than once, but it was recounted that Carter visited the Confeder Confederate Cemetery in Americana, Brazil, laid a cornerstone for a planned museum on American immigration, and was greeted by a group of Confederate descendants, Confederados, while there. And so <laughs> I had to reread that a few times. This is the early 1970s. Yeah. And there's an annual festival the essay says that they held at that cemetery until very recently. I think the essay notes that it was canceled this year due to protests. So I have two questions about this. Uh, first, Brian, what was the most surprising story to come out of this collection of essays, aside from Michelle's? For, for me, it was definitely this one, just because that the beginning in particular blew my mind. But I'd love to hear from you, like how many surprises came out and what was the most surprising to you? Quite a few. Are the, the one that stands out to me is actually from Terry Alford's essay mm -hmm. on John Wilkes Booth. Uh, and what was surprising to me there is that he, he recounts, I believe it's in 1870, it's on a Confederate Memorial Day. And of course, uh, the ladies of the Confederacy, and this is in Baltimore, Maryland, in Greenmount Cemetery, they're there to decorate uh, dead Confederates' graves. But the, the Confederates also decorate John Wilkes Booth's grave. Right, kind of appropriating Lincoln's assassin as a honorary Confederate veteran, and and when I read that in in draft, I was just blown away by um, by that detail. Um, so yeah. that's um, for me that that really stands out. Well, and I was, I mean, piggybacking off that, I was surprised that in a few of the essays, um, you know, uh, especially even in some personal. Uh, grave sites or family grave sites, uh, family cemeteries, and then some that uh, maybe had fallen into disrepair, but then were, were resurrected, so to speak, that flags will pop up that are sometimes placed there by different groups, such as the Sons of the Confederacy. And without the family's knowledge or anything like that, that these connections are being made by other people, um, that even if it's a, a a family cemetery there are other people that feel some sort of connection ownership need to need to place something in that space as well um, michelle uh i'd love to hear from you same same question um having read this book is there something that struck out stuck out to you as particularly a surprising new information um, I have to say it was the essay about old Baldy. It was, um, you know, George, George meets the horse <laughs> and, sure. and that just his head still exists. Um, you know, I, I read that one a, a couple of times and, <laughs> and, you know, I guess we're all used to kind of taxidermied animals in various museums. You can, you know, see, see them here and there. But I guess the, the two things that surprised me is not knowing anything about this horse, how many times it got shot and kept getting up and, you know, and, but I thought it was very sweet that you know, in, a, in a way that, that, you know, Meade continued to want to take care of this horse, which outlived him, but then that other people thought as, as highly of the horse and thought that at least part of him ought to be remembered somewhere as well. So I think that one, and maybe because, you know, so many of the other essays were about humans and we're, we're sort of used to hearing those stories, but I think Old Baldy was the one that really stuck in my mind is, okay, that's different. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Well, and that the whole middle section of the book is generals and their steeds. steeds uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess that's another question I have is, um, you know, since it's not just the humans that we're talking about in this book or that are the, or that are buried, you know, I mean, there are pet cemeteries there are, you know, this is, this is not an unusual or uncommon thing. So um, Brian, how important was that to, to capture um, you know, other participants in this conflict, um, in, including our animal friends? Uh, it was very important to us. I mean, there's a lot of uh, great new scholarship on animals as members of the regimental community. And Jen Murray, who writes this piece on Old Baldy, points out in her essay that Old Baldy was, you know, not exceptional, right? Little Sorrel and, and Traveler, of course. Alan Gelzo's essay on Robert E. Lee mentions uh Tra has a photograph of, of Traveler's uh, burial place as well. So it was important for us, again, to capture kind of the, the diversity and multivocality of, of Civil War graves. Um, so uh, absolutely important. Yeah. Well, and this isn't, you know, this isn't the purpose of the book, but throughout reading it, I kept thinking, you know, about the different stories we have and know about Abraham Lincoln visiting grave sites. Um, including that of his own sons, active mm -hmm. burial sites during the Civil War. Um, of course, the address he gives at, um, at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg. And as, as we just talked about earlier in this, um, you know, President Lincoln's cottage is located right next to not only a, um, a federal cemetery, but a very historic DC cemetery, Rock Creek Church Cemetery as well, where, um, where the Blair family has their mausoleum. So, you know, Lincoln wasn't escaping death, nor was he attempting to. It was all around him at this time, as it was for many other um, Americans. Uh, instead, he almost forced himself to be closer to that human cost of war, seeing thousands of soldiers buried in plain view. Memorialization, you know, I, I think it's easy to think of it as something that comes after. Uh, mm -hmm. But as this book and these essays so rightly point out, it's it's something that's happening while the war is ongoing. So what are your thoughts on how memorialization was a reaction to and shaped the ongoing war itself? Mm -hmm. It's been a, a, a theme of, of my scholarship and my work on, on veterans to think about memory less as kind of commemorative activity. We often think when we think about that word memory of, of post-war reunions or popular culture or public art, uh, but but memory, the, the work of remembrance, um, you know, there is an everyday function to that. Uh, folks who are in hospitals wincing from pain, right, are working through memories of the war. Uh, obviously, the pall of, of grief, and Lincoln feels this, of course, very keenly through the war in his visits to hospitals and the visits to cemeteries. Um, he loses, of course, a child during the war, as does uh, uh, Edwin Stanton. Um, um, and I think that too, to think not just about public death, but about, you know, personal loss that, um, then has to be braided into this larger narrative of, of the war. That's something that we, we have to think about. So they're actively constructing and attempting to make meaning of the war as it's going on, because it's, it's necessary, um, um. Lincoln goes to Gettysburg, right? He has to go to the scene of the war's greatest destruction to define why it has to go on. He, he can't allow those losses um, to be meaningless. He has to define them. Um, and again, that's the, uh, the political power, the afterlife of, of graves, uh, living in quite literally a world of, of death, uh, something that all Civil War Americans have to, to grapple with. Yeah, and Aaron, it's so interesting that you asked, asked that question because that was something I was actually pondering myself earlier of rereading some of the essays and just thinking about the funerals that that Lincoln attended. That that almost gives you something of a microcosm of who's impacted by the war, because you know Elmer Ellsworth's funeral is at the is at the White House. He goes to Edwin M. Stanton's son's funeral. He goes to John Rogers Meggs's funeral. He go and this one's not in in the book, but also he goes to the the funeral of the women who are killed in the in the arsenal explosion mm -hmm. in Washington mm -hmm. D.C. So even if you're just looking at 
not only the the major ones that we know about and, and him living next to the soldiers home cemetery but even just looking at lincoln and that tells you children are dying women are dying as part of their war work you know soldiers obviously are and there's so much and, and one thing that i was even just struck by or just remembering is you know after willie lincoln died i'm, I'm pretty sure i've got this one right franklin pierce wrote him a letter Right about now. about you know i've lost a child like basically these two men had nothing in common except they both lost children in in conjunction with their time as as president and so they became grieving fathers as as opposed to you know rival president rival political parties instead mm -hmm. is that um and with the access you have to the presidential papers and collections are there are there other examples of that that come to mind for you outside of the civil war even um where this idea of um you know there might be world or national events going on wars um spanish american first world war second world war etc um that it, it, in which the the personal is at the as much as the forefront as publicly what's happening well, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure that that's what you're going to find with many presidential papers, yeah. or that if people feel that their heads of government, and whether this was Jefferson Davis or whether it was Abraham Lincoln, if people are losing something as a result of the war, and they feel this connection with an administration, this is one way of expressing it, or, or you know, having this this commonality of 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 loss. And, and, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about why the book seems to resonate with or is resonating with people is they have this personal experience. So I think at, at, a, at a time when people think that their presidents are reading their mail, that's one thing that they can communicate. And it's also this idea of what are, you know, what are the issues that people are willing to give their loved ones for too? And that ends up having a political dimension as as well. Yeah, very well said. Um, so we're going to turn to some audience questions now. We have one from Dan Weinberg, um, and this one was sent in advance. So he recently visited Mount Olivet Cemetery in D.C. that contains the graves of two who were hanged at the end of the Civil War, Henry Burtz, um, the Commandant of Andersonville, and Madame Sur um, Surratt. Her grave is simply marked Mrs. Surratt with no other information. Um, so his questions are... Uh, there are several here, um, so I'll ask just a couple of them. Was her grave marked initially? And if not, what does that imply, if you know? Um, and the second one is, why are there no gravestones for, for any of her daughters who are buried with her? Well, I'll, you know, I'll, try, to, I'll yeah. try to take that one, partially because I, I, I did check a little bit earlier. Um, you know, fortunately, with so many digitized newspapers now, you can track some of these things a little bit better. That um, that it was not originally, it was not initially marked. That uh, 1869 is when the family of Mrs. Surratt is is are the remains are returned to them, and they they bury it at this Catholic cemetery at Mount Olivet. And I don't think it was until 1882 that a marker was put up because someone recognized that there was no marker and essentially it wasn't anybody in the family, but essentially, you know, if, if I provide the stone, someone else will mark it. But, you know, I, I didn't see any particular discussion about, and it, and it turns out the stone that is there now is not the same one that was put up in 1882, but even though it's a slightly different shape, it just still says Mrs. Surratt, um, Mary Surratt on it. And, you know, it, it, it could, I don't know what the discussion was or, mm -hmm. you know, one of her, at least one of her, her children were still, was still alive at the point, at that point. And whether they were brought into the conversation about what do you put on someone's tombstone? And again, this gets to some of these larger points that we've been talking about of what do you, the, the tombstone itself as, as um, conveying information. And do you just put her name on it because either she's so well known and everyone already knows what, what it, what it's about, or, you know, her, her, her life dates aren't even on there as well. So mm -hmm. is that a way of trying to deflect attention from it or making it less of a, of an object of either veneration or retribution? Um, why her kids don't have tombstones, you know, that's another, that's another point, but sometimes it happens in, in families. I mean, I have to say in my own family, there's a great, great uncle who I think is actually still in an unmarked grave and it, 
you know, someone else, you either have to plan for it or someone else has to be cognizant of, of doing that. So whether they, they didn't want to, they didn't have the money to do it or spend, you know, all sorts of calculations to can go into why someone ends up in an unmarked grave. So. Ab absolutely. And one of the, one of the things we haven't talked about here is by choice, right? right. Um, Cause certainly some make that choice that they want, um, you know, in, including my, not necessarily if if it's cremains, you know, and they want it scattered for example, or something like that, it might be unmarked. Um, and we so haven't we, even talked about when you don't know where the body is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, and that, you know, um, and we touched on that a little bit, just referencing the fact that some searched at great length for decades to find a, a loved one. Um, and, and, and sometimes it was, you know, decades later when they finally got some measure of closure. Oats comes to mind. Michelle, do you want to mm -hmm. say anything about that? Oh, that 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 actually was a and 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 that was one of the essays that I that I think is is why Brian and John's book is so different in terms of because this is Glenn La Fantasy talking about when he was writing his biography of William Oates, who was um, an Alabamian who you know, part of the charge on Little Round Top and his brother was mortally wounded and he had to leave and, you know, couldn't stay around to, to make sure his brother was, was, was cared for. And his brother died at Gettysburg and he never knew what happened to the, to the body. And that seemed to haunt him for years and years that they were very, very close. And he had no closure with that until he much later in his life became the commissioner of the marking of the Confederate dead in the North. And all of a sudden had this resources to find out and then discovered that his his brother was was down in Richmond and had been moved later on, and that that seemed to to bring him some some peace with that too. But but what was so lovely about that essay is that Glenn then wove in the story of him and his wife, yes. of, of Glenn and his own wife, and that because she had passed away uh, fairly recently, he now understands what Oates was going through of having this this loss that is so profound and and. So again, that kind of personal aspect of it is, I, I think adds a, a certain amount of maybe a little of the historical process that some of us go through too, that you become very, you know, that, that, that these stories become very personal to you or, you know, you sort of understand uh, what they're going through in that way. Yeah, well, and the Oates story relates directly to our next question from Steve. And um, Steve, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name, it looks like Bob or Bobby, he asks, how did families come and find their family member after a battle and when they were buried in a mass grave? Brian, do you want to attempt the answer to that? So, and again, this is something that uh, bears on on class uh, because, of course, not all families had the the means or the wherewithal to um, to find their their loved ones. Um, one of the stories from the book that comes to mind is the story of. Um, a soldier from the 140th Pennsylvania who was killed on the second day at Gettysburg and his comrades kind of lovingly placed him in a battlefield grave and they etched a, a stone on the, the Gettysburg battlefield and then um, the news of, of his death um, made it back to the hometown and the hometown newspaper and the father had the means um, to send two cousins out uh, to Gettysburg to um, to track down the body and uh, by happenstance right the the burial crew was still at work in Gettysburg and they were able to point um, these family members to the remains um, uh, but often right families weren't that fortunate either because they didn't have the money or because the, the armies had quickly moved on um, soldiers are placed in in mass graves on battlefields and um, um, the remains became un unidentifiable um, so um, you know, I think a lot of these essays ask us to reflect on that word missing. Um, um, right? Yes. Um, and, you know, we we so often as Civil War historians, right, we almost in in kind of a, a rote way, we talk about killed, wounded, missing and captured. And we know a lot about what killed and wounded mean, but we don't often reflect on that word missing and uh, the, the agony that was felt by by so many of these families who who just needed that closure, who didn't have the final resting place, who didn't have the remains. Um, so I think a lot of these essays um, invite us to think more carefully about that word. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, one of the 
going back to something we were talking about earlier, we have some comments, not questions. Um, Lori Miller notes that they have William Tecumseh the Sherman there in St. Louis, mm -hmm. um, which is true. And then um, we do have a question from Tom Horror, who was wanting to know if it's possible to show some of the photos of the graves and memorials. Tom, we don't have a slideshow today, but I will note that one of the things I really appreciated about this book, um, and I know that my colleague Phyllis is posting information on how you can purchase that, is that um, there are wonderful photos, many in, in I think almost all cases, Brian and Michelle, that were taken specifically for these essays um, that show uh, the grave sites and memorials um, or and or in many cases, historic photos of the same. So for example, in Michelle's essay, there's a picture, the, the photo from the John Washington book of the original Keckley grave and then um, um, an updated photograph of the marker with the flowers that Michelle left there for her. So I encourage you to check that out because there are wonderful illustrations for every single one of the essays in this book. Um, so our next question comes from Jim Matthews, who wants to know, um, in Mary Lincoln, Ruth Painter Randall claims the Keckley book was ghostwritten. Okay, so this is going back to that question about Keckley's authorship. And, um, and Jim would like to know what your opinions are on that. Do you agree or disagree? Michelle, do you want to start this one off? <laughs> um, I can try. Um, I don't think it was ghostwritten as many books you know maybe she 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 didn't put pen to paper for every single word of that I know that there was an editor James Redpath so that he may have been taking some of her stories and and putting it into the book and partially we know that that there was an editor because Elizabeth Keckley provided some letters that Mary Lincoln had had and more for context but then without Keckley's permission, they were they were published as an appendix to the book. And and that created, you know, yet another firestorm, because obviously in 1868, some of these things were exceedingly personal and very close to the time period. So I don't I don't think that it was ghostwritten, but, you know, then but what the process was in terms of maybe having some editorial help that the, the one thing I always have wondered, though, is, you know, again, going back to her name being misspelled, that it is on the title page of her book and it's not the same spelling that that, that she used. So that ends up leading to some confusion later too, but yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we also had a question from Dan about whether uh, you could give sort of an overview of the subjects covered in the books. And, and Brian, I didn't ask this question, um, but it is specifically organized into three sections. So maybe if you could speak to that. Um, quickly, just to so that our listeners can understand how the book's organized. There are, we, we can't list all the authors because there are so many. It's really wonderful. Trust me, you want to get this book and read it. Um, but Brian, if you could tell a little bit about how it's organized, I think that would help. Sure. So we have the first section is common soldiers and sailors. And we look at um, um, a lot of, of graves of um, soldiers who uh, people might not immediately recognize, but that take us to interesting places, uh, to uh, kind of family cemeteries, to town cemeteries, to um, uh, faraway places, again, like uh, Mankato, um, Minnesota. Uh, we have a section on generals and their steeds, uh, where we're looking at Old Baldy, at Robert E. Lee, at Ulysses S. Grant, and then a section on civilians. Um, uh, so looking at some of the uh, collateral casualties of the war, looking at uh, university cemeteries, um, um, looking at uh, John Wilkes Booth, and then um, at um, uh, African Americans, uh, both uh, free and enslaved. Excellent. Um, we have another question um, asking whether any graves of the presidents, and they specifically reference this happening to Lincoln's, um, if, if any others have had an attempt of them being broken into um, the way Lincoln's tomb was, there was an attempted break in. So I, I think this might be a question about sort of grave, grave robbing really um, when it comes to presidents, but I welcome you to answer that about um, other civil war graves if you know specifically about that. The only presidential story that comes to mind is actually the grave of William Henry Harrison in North Bend, Ohio, uh, where his son, John Scott Harrison, the body was actually um, taken to, by, I think, Ohio State medical students. Michelle, you may may know that story. Yeah, I do. 
<laughs> well, and and that's actually something that that does show up in in some of the essays, particularly with um, I remember Carrie Janey mentioning it in the UVA is that as you start getting medical schools and they need cadavers to to dissect for the students, grave robbing becomes becomes you know a thing and sometimes it's it's enslaved persons who obviously it's reflective of of what some people feel the value of of the their their remains are but yes in in the case of of benjamin harrison's father um actually they had two grab, grave robbings within a week at the same cemetery and and it turns out that they were looking for one of their other relatives that they knew had been grave robbed and they found benjamin harrison's father instead so you know kind of mid 19th century grave robbing is is an issue not just for for theft of valuables but it's also for these these you know dissection and medical purposes as well but i i can't think of another president off the top of my head i mean i know sometimes remains move around that um uh I'm trying to think is it is it monroe who's at um hollywood, hollywood cemetery and and i think he, you know the, the 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 grave sometimes because in in that case it was well, let's see if we can get these remains moved to Hollywood because then that increases the cachet of the cemetery, and then it, it's something of you know a promotional or, or business um, endeavor as well. But yeah, somebody I'm sure in the audience will will say if we're wrong, but I can't think of another one as quite as um, qu quite as overt as Lincoln's. Okay. Well, and there's one more uh, comment I'm going to slip in and then a question. And I know we need to wrap up, but um, Martin Friedberg notes that he recently toured Andersonville POW camp in the adjacent cemetery. And he learned the story of the prisoner who cataloged deaths and burials as they took place and then returned after the war to organize them. She's yeah. a very interesting story. And then um, Sharon Slodnick asks in mentioning um, Lincoln visiting graves, she's reminded of how visiting graves is not a, as much of a practice in her mind as it has been. And how might this does change affect the future of memorialization and reference? She's wondering your thoughts on that um, and in recognizing the graves to which you refer. So sort of some final thoughts on on how um, really sort of, I guess, the social relationship we have with cemeteries has been changing and how that might affect memorialization moving forward. Brian, you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, I, I think you can see that already through the essays in this book. I mean, we kind of begin in the rural cemetery movement and you know cemeteries kind of being places where people gather where uh, you know speeches are heard where there's political activism uh graves right in the introduction we write about how they featured prominently in political cartoons and thomas nass work in harper's weekly and 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 then that changes over time right they become um, more personal more corporate um and certainly this this question is one that I've thought a lot about as we move more toward cremains and and away from cemeteries, what that means. And I think it's uh, for me, it's kind of tantamount to um, kind of thinking about the art of letter writing, how that's changing and how we're, you know, uh, no longer writing letters or writing emails and social media posts and the way that that will change kind of the written archive of war, mm -hmm. I think kind of in a material sense, you see a, a parallel there from, you know, having these these final resting places to now that are are public to now, um, you know, being very personal and very private in the, in the form of cremains. So what that means about the the memory of war, I mean, I think it's it's obviously still an, an open question, but I think it's it's a part of this um, um, this larger question of what does it mean for us not to to be a writing, um, you know, a letter writing society anymore. Michelle, any final thoughts you want to add? Well, I'm wondering if some of this also has to do, particularly with for those of us who spend a lot more of our time in the 19th century, a, a different a different relationship with death mm. now mm. than than people did in the 19th century because it was all around you, it was in your home, it was very personal, and just you know, and and some of that may may be kind of changing a little bit as well. But just how how people interact with death and what they're expecting of memorialization, and again, you know, when you're when you're doing more scatterings at sea or cremains or just it, it's not necessarily always in in a cemetery but yet the president always goes to arlington on memorial day to right. lay a wreath so there's still those echoes of that being an important part of our our kind of civic culture absolutely thank you so much brian and michelle this was a wonderful conversation thank you for taking the time to be with us today phyllis back over to you
All right. Thank you, Brian, Michelle. Thank you both so much. Um, this has been fascinating for me. I got caught up in it so many times and the questions were just flying in. So it's wonderful. Um, now back to, we are hard at work on preparing our 2024 calendar. So please continue to follow our events page located on our website for information on our next four score speaker series, as well as other upcoming foundation events, including our December 11th event in Washington, DC, honoring Judy Woodruff. We would love to see you there. So visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org for more information. Finally, as you close out tonight's webinar, we thank you in advance for taking a moment to complete a quick survey. On behalf of everyone at the foundation, I wish you all good health and good cheer during this holiday season and throughout the coming new year. Good night. <laughs>